almost everyone is in the room right now and we're gonna start on time. So good morning, everybody. My name is Naomi Matos. I am the press attache here at the US Embassy in Accra, Ghana. As you can see with this video box, we're all working from home. So thanks for joining us through our virtual workplace, Zoom, um, as we bring to you the second session of our three-part series on reporting on COVID-19. So in the background, we have Africa Regional Services Paris, a couple members supporting us, as well as two familiar names and faces, um, Joyce Asedu and Courage Ahiyati. They're gonna be supporting us from the US Embassy on the Press team. Um, Joyce is gonna help me with moderating the discussion. Courage is our technical person, um, making sure that uh, you see the slideshow and the videos that accompany it. At any time, if like last time, the chat box is disabled, please feel free to shoot Joyce a WhatsApp and we'll get that back online. So welcome for all those who just joined, please put in your full name, outlet, and region and email address, and we're going to get started. Um, but before I kick it over to our speaker, Sarah Walker, I just wanted to play a welcome address um, from our French spokesperson and director of the African Regional Media Hub down in Johannesburg, South Africa, who will just give an overview of the importance of journalism, COVID-19, and also talk a little bit about the Africa Regional Media Hub. So it's a very short video, two minutes, play that and we'll get started, okay? So let me just share my screen. And Sarah, please let me know if uh, for whatever reason we can't hear the audio. But we tested it, so it should work, right? My name is Marissa Scott. I'm the French language spokesperson for the Department of State and the director of the Africa Regional Media Hub based in Johannesburg. On behalf of the department, I would like to welcome you and thank you for your participation in the COVID-19 webinar. Effective journalism is one of the most important components to halting the spread of COVID-19 by raising public awareness, disseminating instructions, learning and sharing new information, and holding governments and non-governmental organizations responsible. This is especially critical when rumors and misinformation circulate quickly on social media, causing panic at times and leading the public to take inappropriate actions. By attending today, we hope to share with you best practices for accurate and timely reporting that will serve your readers and the citizens of your country in the midst of this health crisis. I would also like to take this moment to highlight the long-standing partnership on health between the United States and Africa. The United States has committed more than $100 billion over the past 20 years towards public health on the African continent and trained over 285,000 healthcare workers. With PEPFAR alone, over 18 million lives have been saved in 18 years. And now, in the fight against COVID-19, that commitment continues. Of the more than $780 million the U.S. has pledged worldwide to fight the virus, close to $250 million is geared towards Africa. The United States has also mobilized businesses, NGOs, and faith-based organizations to contribute to efforts to address the pandemic. We will continue to collaborate with our African partners and to be transparent in our efforts. Thank you again for your participation today. The Africa Regional Media Hub is pleased to be a part of this effort. Please follow us on Twitter at Africa Media Hub. I wish you a fruitful webinar. Okay. So hopefully most of you guys heard that. If not, there were subtitles, um, but we can always send around the video later. So we're gonna get started. Um, and just as a reminder, this will be uh, recorded. Um, and so again, for people who just joined, my name is Naomi Matos. Um, I am the press attache at the US Embassy here in Accra. And we have a support team helping us out today. The information assistant, Joyce Asedu, and digital engagement coordinator, Courage Ahiyati, will be helping us out. 
um, in this discussion, the second part of the three-part series on COVID-19 reporting. Today, Sarah is going to be talking about the depoliticization of um, the depoliticizing the pandemic, uh, decrypting disinformation. Um, I know a lot of you are already familiar with uh, Sarah Walker, but for those of you who are new to this series, um, Sarah Walker is a, a U.S. Uh, journalist and international trainer, and she's been working as a journalist for written press, television, newswires, and websites. Um, she's worked for publications like the International New York Times, Wall Street Journal, The Economist, CNBC Magazine, to name a few, and she regularly teaches. Uh, regularly teaches courses on business and investigative reporting, including for the Thomas Reuters Foundation for Journalists in Franklin, Africa. And she's worked with us um, last year. She came, was here in person um, and she traveled around Ghana. And so she's a familiar face for many of you. So without further ado, I would like to um, kick it over to Sarah uh, to get started. So Sarah, over to you. Well, welcome everybody uh, to part two of uh, covering COVID-19. Um, today, the discussion is going to be in two parts. The first part uh, for this trend, which is happening in every country, including in Ghana, uh, which is politicians, business leaders, religious leaders, other community leaders who are politicizing the pandemic to their own ends. What is our role as journalists in the middle of this? That will be the first half. I'll take a few questions at the end of that segment. The second part will have to do with a second pandemic, which is happening alongside COVID-19, uh, which the World Health Organization is calling the infodemic. We are seeing a record amount of uh, fake news around the pandemic. And once again, what is the role of the journalist in this? What should we be reacting to? What should we not be reacting to? And how should we react to it? And I will give you a wonderful toolkit which has been created during this pandemic of ways that you can quickly fact check your stories. So let's get started. Just to remind you, this presentation, there is no need to take any notes on the content of the presentation. But please, uh, if you have questions along the way, submit them in the chat box and Naomi and the, uh, the team are going to then ask me the questions and I will respond. Okay, let's start the presentation. Okay, next slide. Just to remind you, as I said in the first session, uh, this pandemic is very, very fast. It's moving fast in terms of new discoveries. Since the last time we talked, there's been big news in the US about a new treatment coming from a pharmaceutical company in Boston that showed positive results with eight people that couldn't become a vaccine. This is something that could change the entire dynamic of the pandemic. Sadly, there's been new centers of outbreak that have gotten worse and have cropped up even in the past week. Russia is now the third largest center of new infections. There's more and more concerns that things are getting worse in several countries in Latin America. Uh, Brazil isn't on this list, but Brazil is at the top of that list. Peru, Ecuador. There are growing concerns in India. And now in the United States, the nation is the number one hotspot. It's replaced uh, New York as the number one uh, large source of, of new infections. And this is all in, in one week, this has happened. At the same time, we're moving, the pandemic is moving into a new phase. We're moving away from what I would call the first phase, into a new phase where some countries have managed to flatten the curve, and we've talked about that, and they're starting to open up their economies, places like Germany, Singapore, South Korea, Hong Kong. And now, uh, as of today, 
we have the news that all 50 states in the US are gonna be opening in different ways. Um, but that comes with its own dangers, dangers of fresh outbreaks. And already here in France, we're only two weeks into an opening. We're already seeing two regions of France where there are fresh outbreaks. So this begins a new phase of what experts are calling this sort of opening and closing in waves, which is going to happen as long as we have the pandemic or until some kind of treatment or vaccine is found. So we're, we're kind of moving into a, another phase here. But what does that mean, this new phase? That means the governments have still got to really well manage the pandemic in terms of testing people and getting those tests out reliably and accurately, tracing the contacts of the new infections, and isolating people, having a plan in place especially for people who are unable to isolate in their own home. And so now the attention is really on two fronts for governments, how to open up safely and how to get the economy back up and running. And whether or not more aid, and I think that's quite certain in many countries, there's going to be new aid packages that will be needed to keep citizens and businesses afloat so that when the pandemic ends, when it ends, that our economies are not completely destroyed. So just to give you a little bit of uh, update on that, at the same time here in Africa, uh, there are new sources of outbreak as well. In Nigeria, a week ago, there was concern about the state of Kano. Now it looks like the outbreak is spreading to four other northern regions in Nigeria. There are fresh concerns that the highest number of infections per capita in Africa is now in Djibouti, even though it may reflect uh, widespread testing. There are more concerns about Somalia, even though once again, they don't have a good handle on the picture there. And Tanzania seems to be getting worse. So the situation in Africa is also very rapidly changing, especially uh, in the eastern parts and in Nigeria, and all of that since the last time that we talked. Next slide. So what's happening now is that this pandemic is putting the world under tremendous pressure. Next slide. What kind of pressure? Pressure on our political systems, you know, holding, trying to hold our leaders accountable for whether or not they've been doing the right things to get this pandemic under control. But there's other kinds of pressure too. Pressure on our constitutions. That concerns things like privacy issues when it comes to tracing our contacts, tracing our whereabouts, trying to keep tabs on new infections. There are more and more allegations of police overreach as they try to go out there and make sure that people are self-distancing and and wearing masks. There's also pressure on our countries that look like, the, like Ghana are going to have elections coming up. Should we have elections? Can we have elections safely? Do we, can, can we pivot towards mail-in ballots? How are we going to conduct elections in the middle of a pandemic? And of course, there's enormous pressure on economies everywhere. We are now seeing the worst joblessness in the US in our history since we started counting which was around the time of uh, probably World War I, World War II, World War worse than the Great Depression. Huge pressure on economies. Next slide. As a result, this has become, and because this pandemic, there's so little that's known about it. How do you treat it? What kind of tests work? Who who gets it? Who doesn't get it? Why is it spreading in certain countries and not in others? Uh, so much is unknown about this disease and everything is changing so quickly. It creates a tremendous environment of uncertainty. And certain actors can take advantage of that because they have their own self-interest at play. So you're seeing in many countries in the world, you know, the political opposition is, you know, criticizing the ruling party and, and Sometimes uh, their criticisms are unproven or they're not looked into deeply enough or with false criticisms. You have certain leaders, they could be religious leaders, they can be political leaders, 
uh, in many countries who are offering the public unproven and, and sometimes even dangerous, what they're saying are cures for the pandemic. There aren't any at this point, as we all know. And some of the leaders out there uh, trying to hold up their, their leadership are downplaying the severity of COVID-19. Some leaders are saying, well, you know, how is this any different than, than the flu, for example? So there's a tremendous politicization going on, politicization, it's a hard word to say, of the pandemic. Next slide. And at the same time, uh, and I see it on the streets here in, in France when I go out for my evening walks and I walk in different directions to try to get uh, a handle on what's happening here. You see, extremist parties are, are fomenting arrest and uh, unrest, and, and some of them are on the left and some of them are on the right. Um, so they're agitating. Um, you see leaders looking for scapegoats also, uh, either members of the opposition, uh, countries outside their borders or, or, or the vulnerable groups among us, you know? So you see leaders looking for scapegoats. Um, you see incumbents who are calling for unity to stop a partisan backlash. But sometimes that can actually be a strategy to prevent journalists from actually doing the solid work of holding leaders accountable for their handling of the pandemic. Don't be criticizing us too, too much. So these are other ways in which the message is getting distorted. Next slide. So why are they doing this? Why are, are these leaders politicizing the pandemic? Well, a lot, of, a lot of the leaders are doing it to try to take away attention from us holding them accountable for how they are actually managing this crisis. That's the first thing they're trying to do. The second thing, is that if they can divert your attention towards you know, a false or unproven criticism or uh, a false or a fake cure, they can get you to publish a story instead of once again asking the really tough questions about their handling of the crisis. You know, whether there are enough tests, whether these are reliable tests, whether citizens are being protected enough while, where they work and where they live, whether more aid is needed. So it gets us you know, talking about this story here instead of the real story we should be focusing on. Also, uh, members of the opposition and sometimes uh, leaders are doing it to try to divide the nation and siphon off support for the, the, power, the party in power, for example, and to weaken the ruling party through hurting the pandemic response with false allegations and, and empty criticisms. So this is why they're doing it trying to take advantage of the, of the pandemic. Next slide. The other thing that some leaders are doing is they're sending mixed messages. And they're doing it not just in what they say, but what they do and how they present themselves. And by doing that, they are sowing confusion in the public on exactly what they should be doing and, and not be doing to prevent themselves from, from getting, um, getting COVID-19. Um, like not, maybe not wearing a mask in a large gathering, for example, is, is one way for a leader to undermine the messages from health officials. Another thing is to label health expertise as some kind of a conspiracy by, by elites. Again, this undermines then the authority of the health messages that are coming. And it paves the way for politicians to take actions that may be against or not strong enough instead of sticking to what the scientists are saying and the real fact-based advice on the measures and the policies that, that we need to be taking. Next slide. So some of these things may be happening in Ghana and some of these may not be, but I think I wanna make you aware that these are some of the more common strategies which are being used to politicize the message because these messages know no borders and politicians in one country learn from what politicians are doing in another. So this is to make you aware of what some of the more common strategies are out there so that you can be a bit skeptical if you start to see 
uh, leaders in the country um, adopting any of these. They may not be, uh, but be beware of these, these kinds of strategies. Next slide. Of course, populism is on the rise again, you know, pandering to the public. And unfortunately, um, journalists who are covering the pandemic um, are being attacked. Uh, they're being put in jail and some of them are being silenced or, you know, journalists are starting to self-censor themselves. Um, this has really uh, become very pronounced during the pandemic. Unfortunately, there is a historical pre precedent for this. Uh, this happened in many countries during the last major global pandemic, which was the flat Spanish flu in 1918. In fact, the way that the Spanish flu got its name was because Spain was the first country to create, the government created a very clear and transparent way of addressing the, the epidemic in its country. And that's how it was actually named the Spanish flu. It was the first country to be very upfront and frank and clear about what was happening on the ground. Next slide. So I, I think it's good to just talk about really what is populism? What is this pandering to the pandemic going on? What, what does that mean, populism? I think it's interesting to know actually the best definition that I've ever heard of populism. Next slide. And it came from a meeting that I had here in, in Paris with a very well-known independent weekly investigative newspaper. It's called the Canard Enchaîné. And the editor in a meeting with a group of our, us American journalists a couple of years ago said to me, the definition of populism is telling the people what they want to hear. In other words, in this pandemic, we're working on a cure. It's going to cure you. Sunlight is a cure. Telling people what they want to hear. Next slide. And it's working in some ways because people are afraid. They're afraid for themselves because as I've said, it's so uncertain what's going on. So little is known about the virus and how it spreads. People are worried. They're worried for their personal safety. They're worried for the families. And because of this infodemic of disinformation around the virus, it does tend to weaken the trust in science and in leadership. That's why they do it. Next slide. Something else you need to be aware of, which is a technique that comes from, from public relations and politics is a technique called, called framing. What that means is casting an argument between either we do this or we do that. By framing an argument between a binary choice, then it narrows the argument to two choices and makes it hard for journalists to break out of that frame and ask questions that fall outside of it. Now, these are some of the frames you see an awful lot in many countries right now along the pandemic, which is that there's a trade-off between saving lives or saving the economy. This is probably the one I find most dangerous. And there is plenty of research historically that those countries that do the right things from the very beginning to stop an epidemic, economies rebound much faster. So this is a false argument that we have to make this trade off. But I see it now very much in the press. And for myself as a health and medical journalist, I find it very concerning. The second framing of the the argument happening is it's between locking down or being confined and following these very strict measures or your own personal liberty. So it's between or between an authoritarian way of governing a police state versus freedom. And then the other framing is just sending lots of mixed messages about health practices and health advice. So I would ask you um, to reflect after we'd have this course together. If you can think of ways in which leaders in Ghana may also be doing 
this kind of political framing of these either or choices. We are not in an either or world, but it's a way to uh, restrict open debate and it's a way of fending off the hard questions of how our leaders are actually managing the pandemic. Next slide. I would say there's only one frame and most health authorities would say the same. It's about saving lives. That's the only frame there is. And that's really what we need to keep in mind as we start, as we continue to report in this pandemic. So the first thing you need to do when these allegations come up on the part of politicians, for example, in Ghana, as I understand it, the opposition is making these claims, for example, that the distribution of food may be a sign of political favoritism towards the ruling party, or perhaps towards receiving water or electricity or financial aid. What you need to do in these situations is fact check any of those allegations. Check them out. If a politician is saying that there's been an unequal distribution of food in two or three regions in Ghana, you need to send out reporters and you need to get to the bottom of it. You cannot just take at face value what they tell you, you need to check it out. You need to go and you need to report or you need to find local reporters who you can rely on to get the information, check it out, fact check these allegations. So that's absolutely important. Don't just report what they say, check it out before you report anything. There may be nothing to it and that becomes your story. Please fact check any allegations that are made. The second area, and this is not happening just in Ghana, it's happening in many countries. As we said, the whole understanding of the disease and how to monitor it and how to track it is evolving. There are many allegations about discrepancies in data. The data is arriving too late. Uh, the government isn't revealing all the data that they have. Uh, or that they may be manipulating the data. Um, do not publish these allegations without checking them out thoroughly. First of all, what does that mean uh, there's discrepancies in the data? You need to know exactly what those allegations are, precisely what is the problem here. And then you need to interview public health statistics experts and ask them about this before publishing any statement of allegations. And then, you may not always get an agreement among statisticians. You must have at least three who agree that this practice is wrong for whatever reason they say it is. And once you know that, you must also find out what is really the consequence to the general public, to the public health of the nation. What is at stake for public health? Let's say, for example, uh, the information on the number of cases of new infections in Ghana is only being published every three or four days. Well, maybe that isn't best practices, but I wouldn't say that's going to endanger public health per se. It just means that you're getting the data late because what matters, as we discussed in the first session, is what happens with that data over a period of, of weeks, not days. So, you know, dig into, get, in, get all the details you can on exactly what are these allegations are all about. Talk to statisticians, get their point of view. It may or may not be true that there's a real problem with the, with the data discrepancy. So get to the bottom of it before you publish any of these allegations on, on data discrepancies. Next slide. So, you know, data is the simmering issue, but don't be part of a manipulation between, you know, the ruling party and the party in opposition. Don't let yourself get played. Data, as I said in the first session, um, is an issue in many countries. In the United States, the issue is that regional authorities and city authorities are sending their information to our national authority by email and by fax. So the information is arriving a bit late. And there's a lot of complaints that our Centers for Disease Control is publishing the data late. 
As a result, there is, uh, as I mentioned last time, a group of journalists that got together and created a project to publish this data called the COVID Tracking Project. But once again, you need to really understand the way the data are being collected by these authorities and talk to health statisticians to find out whether or not these data are reliable and comparable, whether or not you decide to use them for public uh, publication or to hold off and to use it more for policymakers and leaders. So I would say take a look and you know, spend some time at the COVID tracking project and see what they're doing. I think it's quite interesting. Next slide. Now, I understand that there have been some claims in Ghana about, uh, from the opposition, the party in opposition, about uh, possible allegations that the ruling party is playing around uh, with the pandemic may get in the way of um, doing the voter registration. And this is, a, this is interesting. Um, I have to say that for countries um, going into an election season, we are in a bit of uncharted territory here of how to handle uh, keeping the public safe versus going out and voting. And most societies are not prepared for uh, mail-in voting or voting by computer. So it's creating a, a real problem in many societies, as well as how do you protect the public uh, when they do go out and vote or when they are, get uh, contacted you know, for voter rolls. Um, so I would say to you that regarding this issue of the voter register, you need to talk to political analysts and experts across the political spectrum and get a range of views. Don't, again, once again, don't just publish an allegation and provide some context and background to the allegation, even at the risk of repeating yourself uh, from time to time. Why is this an issue in Ghana about the, about the voter registration? How far back does this go? Why does it matter for the country? You need to educate the public a bit on this issue while you get to the bottom of whether or not this is actually an issue or not an issue. And you need to talk to parties on both sides of the spectrum, not just one side. That's not journalism, political journalism. It's about talking to both sides and also to a range of players on both sides of the political spectrum. They won't all agree for either party. Next slide. Let me give you an example of something going on in the US. It doesn't necessarily provide any kind of direct connection with what's happening with Ghana, but I think it gives you an understanding of how you can report on something that could be a very sensitive election issue and do it fairly. And I just wanna show you a couple of examples that come from an article that the New York Times did about a vote that took place in, in Wisconsin that was contested by the Democrats who wanted uh, to have a mail-in voting system and um, a court decision decided that it was going to be in-person voting. This happened recently. So this, I want to just read to you the first paragraph of this article. I think it's quite interesting. Wisconsin voters will face a choice between protecting their health and exercising their civic duty on Tuesday. And then explains the decision that was made. The political and legal skirmishing throughout Monday was only the first round of an expected national fight over voting rights in the year of COVID-19. In other words, this is an unresolved issue for the United States. We are also in an election year, but it explains what's at stake here for the nation and for the state. And it shows you the two sides of the argument, the Democratic side of the argument and the Republican side of the argument. So it's balanced. Next slide. Once again, this, the New York Times shows you the two points of view between the, the two political sides. Since the pandemic first forced stay-at-home orders, many Democrats have advocated for a vote-by-mail system. Republicans in several states and the president himself, however, are pushing for as much in-person voting as possible. So it lays out the positions of both sides. 
it's fair, it's balanced. It gives both sides a chance to comment on this issue. Again, because pandemic coverage is free at the New York Times website, I would encourage you, especially political reporters, to go and read this article and analyze the ways in which this article takes great pains to be fair to both sides. It's a very difficult thing to do, what political journalists do. Next slide. So going on further in this article, the New York Times quotes an independent source, a law professor. They try to get to the bottom of the issue of the difference between in-person and mail-in ballots. You know, there's all these allegations in the US of possible voter fraud. So he says that yes, you know, mail is more vulnerable than in-person voting. But then he goes on to say, we know that voter fraud, while very rare, more commonly occurs with absentee ballots than in-person voting. We got, they got an independent expert, a professor of law that studies voting very closely to comment on it. And he nuances the issue. Yes, it's slightly more vulnerable, but it's again, the cases of voter fraud are very rare. This is a US issue, but it's just to show you the use of an independent expert, the nuancing of the issue. This is the kind of reporting that you do to get to the bottom of an election issue in a pandemic. Next slide. Now, as I mentioned, and this is happening in many African countries, it's happening in Asia, it's happening in many, many countries in the world, leaders are coming out and telling people that there are ways that you can cure yourself from COVID or ward off the disease because it's a populist message. So I wanna show you uh, an example from Indonesia that you also see in Africa and how a Reuters reporter handled it. Again, sticking to the science. This is what you must always do, stick to the science. In Indonesia, the Home Affairs Minister said that COVID-19, excuse me, won't spread the country, won't spread in the country because it has a tropical climate. So he was advising the citizens to sunbathe to ward off disease. As a result, apparently, Indonesians are tanning all over the country, something that they typically don't do, which as you probably know, will increase the risk of skin cancer if you do too much of it. Next slide. So let's see how you report on something like this. So this comes uh, from a Reuters report and an economist report. These are the data points in a, such an article. The first and the most important point, there are no clinical trials, which is, as we talked about in the first session, the most, the gold standard of research, that show COVID-19 is reduced by sunlight exposure. However, there are plenty of studies that show that 10 to 15 minutes of exposure to sunlight will boost the body's immune system. And in fact, because this is such a fast moving story, before I got online with you, I read that they are now saying that you should boost your immune system with exposure to sunlight, uh, because apparently that will make you, if you do get COVID, perhaps your symptoms will be less severe. So that's a nuancing of it. So how would I do this in Ghana? I want, think you want to go and contact your local medical researchers and have them speak to you for your article, if someone were to start talking about a cure about sunlight, and quote them in your article. Another place to go, and I'm going to give you a whole list of these at the end of today. Every week, the World Health Organization has a website. It's called the COVID-19 Myth Busters website. When you see these kinds of things floating around, go to the website. There's a very good chance that the World Health Organization will have already fact-checked very, very thoroughly the claims that are made and what scientific basis does or does not exist for these claims. So go to the site and see what's already been published before you do your own digging around. But I think it's a great idea to quote your local medical researchers. Give them credit. I would go to them anyway. 
Next slide. So one of the things that we know in the US for best practices is that the, the scientists need to take the lead in giving guidance to the public on what they should or should not be doing. Uh, and because in, a, in an epidemic where there are no treatments and there is no cure, the only measures that we have are public health measures. In the US, we've had some great examples of leadership. I wanna show you a video of Dr. Amy Acton She's the director of the Ohio Par Department of Public Health. She, I think, is a great example of what leadership looks like in a pandemic. And I think the various qualities that she shows are ones that all leaders, whether they polit be political or scientific, should demonstrate. Oh, hey, Courage, we can't hear the audio. Should we try one more time and then we'll, we'll move on and I'll cover her point. Sure, yeah, Courage, just let us know if you're able to try one more time. This is no small thing that we are doing together. It is so incredibly hard to, to have shut down our lives the way we have. I am absolutely certain you will look back and know that you helped save each other. This is Dr. Amy Acton, director of the Ohio Department of Health. Trademark lab coat, emphatic hand gestures, and a knack for metaphors. It's like Swiss cheese. So I want you to picture a hurricane. When you have a fire on your stove and you have your kitchen extinguisher, you want to get it quick. You may not have seen her press briefings, but in Ohio, they've become a daily ritual, catapulting her from unknown local official to cult icon. Questions? Dr. Amy can help us fight out the coronavirus. In her youth, Dr. Acton overcame neglect and homelessness on her way to being crowned homecoming queen. And last year, she became the first doctor appointed to run Ohio's health department. Under her, Ohio has become a leader in responding to COVID. It declared a state of emergency with just three confirmed cases. And it was the first state to shut down schools. Later that same week, some governors were still proudly eating in packed restaurants. And Dr. Acton issued a stay-at-home order affecting more than 11 million people when the death toll was still just three. So how did Dr. Acton do it? To find out, we watched more than seven weeks of press briefings and we noticed themes that, well, let's just say other leaders should pay attention to. First up, she empowers us. Take a look at this clip from the day Dr. Acton issued that stay at home order. I don't want you to be afraid. I am not afraid. I am determined. But I need you to do everything. I want you to think about the fact that this is our one shot in this country. All of us are going to have to sacrifice. And I know someday we'll be looking back and wondering, what was it we did in this moment? Of her 65 words there, 12 are pronouns. Her repeated use of I tells us she's in it with us. She's taking ownership. Her use of you makes the audience feel a connection with her, even though we're watching from home. Toward the end, she switches from singular to collective pronouns, signaling that she's just like us and we're in it together. She's in charge, yet she's made us feel like the heroes. There are everyday heroes everywhere. We know that not all heroes wear capes. You're heroic when you stay at home and watch your neighbor who's a nurse's child. I know you're all donning those capes in big ways and small ways. Please help us. Thank you. Ohioans were inspired. 
not just to stay at home, but to spread her messages to each other. Another theme of Dr. Acton's briefings is brutal honesty. And to understand this one, we have to take you back to mid-April. People were getting restless, wondering when things would get back to normal. So I do hope no one at home thinks like it's wide open May 1st, going back to life as normal. The rules have changed and they're not going to be quite the same. Life will be different uh, for quite some time to come and maybe in some ways that are permanent. She's preparing us for the long haul even if it's not what we want to hear. It's really hard to hear that, but we are not going back to six months ago. That That's not the reality we all face. This is something she does a lot, actually. Setting up bad news with a warning. Ohioans, you know, I know that's hard to take. I know that's a hard truth for people because we want there to be a right answer in a right way. And I know this is a deep breath we all must take. Dr. Acton's also honest about what she doesn't know. We have to be very clear and transparent with you. All of these numbers are a gross underestimation, and we have no real idea of the prevalence of this infection yet. A lot of leaders just avoid talking about uncertainty, but when Dr. Acton repeatedly says, We don't know. It's actually calming to hear her admit what we all feel deep down, that we just don't have the full story. And finally, Dr. Acton sees vulnerability as a strength. After watching dozens of hours of briefings, there was one word we kept hearing over and over. Please just acknowledge and give a name to what you're going through. Acknowledge it with each other. And so I just want to acknowledge that these are, are still really tough times. This is wearing on all of us. And I just want to acknowledge that. I just want to acknowledge that all of us are feeling this. It's such an unprecedented time. Hearing Dr. Acton acknowledge our harder emotions forces us to face them head on. Stuffing down fear and sadness just causes more stress and may make us act more selfishly instead of empathizing with each other. You'll have days when you're anxious, but don't, don't kill yourself over that. Please know and forgive yourself and try again. And take a look at what she does here. Every day I go through stages of grief. I go through, you know, denial. I go through a little anger. I go through a little bargaining. I don't have to wear this. I might not need it. This isn't true. I get a little down. When she tells us she's struggling too, we feel seen and heard and less alone. And maybe that's all any of us want right now. In a pandemic, the words our leaders choose can save lives. As of the end of April, Ohio had recorded fewer than a thousand COVID deaths. By comparison, neighboring Michigan suffered more than 3,000, even though Ohio has a bigger population and had its first case three weeks earlier. Of course, other factors help explain this, but Dr. Acton convinced millions of Ohioans to stay at home, not by ordering them, but by inspiring them. People at home, you are moving mountains. You are saving lives. Again, I get emotional talking about this because this is no small thing that we are doing together. It is so incredibly hard to, to have shut down our lives the way we have. I am absolutely certain you will look back and know that you helped save each other in this state. The, the, the impact is profound. Please at home, don't stop. Okay. Let's go back to the presentation. Next slide.
Uh, this is a very interesting recent survey that was done uh, by Harvard Kennedy School of Government. They did a survey of 23,000 Americans in all 50 states. Uh, and across the political parties, didn't matter if they were anywhere in the spectrum, they had a much higher trust in the scientific institutions to handle the pandemic, much higher than government at, at any level. Um, and the trust is high of medical professionals, of scientists, and the Centers for Disease Control. The point being that it's really the health authorities that should be the, the leading voices on how we manage this pandemic. Next slide. This is an article I'd like you to read sometime if you could. It's a very interesting article which shows the difference between uh, how Seattle handled the pandemic and how New York City handled the pandemic. The short story is that Seattle relied very much on uh, it, the facts, the science, relied very much on its scientific leaders, uh, and less so on its politicians, and New York was, was the opposite. Next slide. Next slide. So, you know, best practices, the lead spokesperson typically should be a scientist and not a politician. Um, the unfortunate thing is that if a politician is the lead spokesperson, you run the real risk that a country, uh, people who come from the opposition won't listen. That's why the scientist, uh, in, according to best practices, should, should lead. Um, so these are some things to keep in mind when we had the H1N1 outbreak in, in the US. Um, Obama simply repeated what the health authorities said, you know, at the start of the pandemic, and then he just sort of echoed the advice. Uh, and at no time did he, you know, bring up any hope about possible treatments or, or cures. So, you know, we all know what the best practices are. They can be very hard to do in the middle of a crisis when countries and governments are under pressure. But um, as a part of this course, I just want to make you aware of these are, this is a body of knowledge about how to handle pandemics that the Centers for Disease Control has put in place and used very effectively. And many states in the US have followed uh, these best practices. Next slide. So the best antidote is hold politicians to account for what your scientists and your health officials are recommending. You know, point out any reasons for the falsehoods, such as you know, diverting attention away from specific uh, things that uh, may not be good about the way the leader is handling the pandemic. If a leader is making certain claims, health claims, press for hard scientific evidence, such as well-designed research studies. And check to see if a politician's directions on the pandemic are aligning with scientific directives. And if not, hold the politicians accountable for the difference. Next slide. Our role as journalists, and this I learned when I first became a journalist, a health journalist in the United States. One of our key roles as health journalists is we are debunkers of myths. And this is especially true in a pandemic. Next slide. I'll take one or two questions on the content so far, and then we're gonna talk about the infodemic. Naomi, do you want to perhaps ask me one or maybe two questions? If you sure, got sure, okay. So um, just so sorry, guys, I had a power cut in between. So thank you for resubmitting your questions. Um, we had a couple about the upcoming um, election here in Ghana. So I'm gonna couple them together. So okay. one was like a basic question of is it safe for Ghana to go ahead with its election in the midst of the pandemic? And the other one, um, you mentioned, Sarah, that you were following kind of the debate with the new register and the elections coming up. And the question is, under these polarized conditions, how do we get an objective report? I would, um, let's talk about the election and whether or not it's safe or not in a pandemic. 
I am not a health expert. I am a journalist. My job to find out whether it's safe or not is to go to the bodies and the authorities in Ghana who are responsible for analyzing and deciding on whether or not it is safe to go forward. I'm going to give you an interesting example of what is happening here in France, which I think would apply in Ghana or in any country. Here in France, before the lockdown in March, we had the first of two rounds of municipal elections. It was decided it was uh, the pen, we had the lockdown right after the first round and the second round was canceled. Now the government is deciding, now that the curve here has been flattening, whether or not to hold the second round in June. So I just read an article in Le Monde about this. What's happening? There is a scientific body that has analyzed the results from the first round to determine whether or not the first round of in-person voting had an effect on the pandemic. And they have found, no, it did not. Now they're going to decide whether or not to hold elections in the second half of June. So what are they doing? They are not gonna decide until they get enough data now that the economy is open only for two weeks. They're gonna take four weeks of data. And in early June, they will analyze that data to see whether or not they think the country is continuing to manage the pandemic. And if it is managing the pandemic correctly, then they will also work with all the election authorities here to determine under what conditions can voting take place. These are the kinds of questions that you need to put to your election commission, to all the election bodies that are responsible for this, for all the scientific authorities. I am sure they have put together some kind of a scientific body to examine these questions in Ghana. I think this would be a very interesting uh, idea for an article, but you must ask the scientists working on this issue. Also what they're doing in France, which I think is a great idea, they're going to have a public debate in the parliament about this so that all political parties can weigh in on this, which is going to take place in the next two weeks so that all the political parties can weigh in on their views of this. And then they're going to come to a consensus decision on what to do. So this gives you an idea of what you need to look at to determine whether or not. This pandemic, as I said, is until there is a, a cure, a vaccine or treatments, most experts are saying this, this disease is gonna go in a series of waves. Lockdown, opening up, lockdown, opening up in a selective way. So the data have to be constantly analyzed week after week after week before certain decisions are made, such as whether or not to do in-person and voting. The other part to this is what is Ghana doing? Perhaps uh, are they looking at, at uh, mail-in ballots? Are they looking at other ways that people can vote? Under what conditions are they thinking about voting to take place? This should all be in your article. Regards the new register, I realize you're in a polarized condition. We are also in the United States. We cannot, we don't make the conditions of our countries, we journalists, but what we must do is to interview people across the entire political spectrum on both sides and independent authorities and get the range of reporting that you need and the facts before you do an article about this new register. I would really suggest that you take a look at this Wisconsin article and analyze very carefully how those journalists did that. Okay, shall we move on? Um, well, I did have, well, there was a, um comment that I think really summarizes what you're talking about by Marie. Um, she was saying, I believe journalists should be selective and not report just anything because it's coming from a politician, especially with regards to COVID-19. The focus should be on facts, how to demystify all the myths surrounding COVID and the urgent need to stop stigma. Um, and then the other, uh, and Kazito was saying on the issue of data from February WHO, especially in African region. Oh wait, this is a question. How do we as journalists look past all the controversies that have come up in Africa and beyond? Well, what specifically are we talking about? You're talking about data now? Um, Kazito mentioned data, but Kazito, if you want to be more specific, why don't you just type it into the comments? Um, and uh, the other thing, Sarah, uh, there's just questions about, and I think you'll probably cover it through your, your 
your presentation and you kind of covered it in the first session, but folks were expressing frustrations in their various regions about trying to get people on the record, trying to talk to health officials that are leading the COVID-19 effort, but they don't really want to engage the media. And so they're getting frustrated and they want to know how can we get the facts to their to the reading public or people viewing their news um, when that is the situation that they're facing. That's a very difficult one. Um, it should be their job to be clear and transparent, but I can't, you know, get you can't get people to speak. You first the, the first thing is there's two possible solutions to that. First of all, it's always a relationship of trust between a journalist and, a, and an expert. And trust does not build overnight. And we are in a crisis. It's very difficult to build trust in a crisis. Sometimes if you could work with that individual and say, I understand, you know, this is a very sensitive topic. Can I quote you as an anonymous source, but I need to quote you as an official, either in the health ministry or close to the health ministry who has requested anonymity then the reader knows or the reviewer knows, listener, who this person is, they're credible. So you serve that, that, and then maybe through time, through doing article after article, you will build up enough trust with the health official where you can eventually quote them on the record. The other thing you can do with these officials is you can negotiate with them, say, all right, I will quote you anonymous, anonymously on this with this specific attribution, so people know you are a health official. And then on other things, quote, I quote you on the record that are less controversial, which will give your story more credibility and authority. So that's a kind of an interim way to deal with it. Okay, great, Sarah. Um, so I just let the group know that due to time constraints, um, if their questions aren't answered, we'll figure out a way to answer them in between sessions. But just to be cognizant of time, yes running up on the 30 minute mark. And I know you have a lot of awesome stuff to share. Yes. On to the next slide. So UNESCO has actually gotten a term for this huge wave of disinformation that is washing across Facebook and Twitter and WhatsApp. They're calling it an infodemic. They think it's just as dangerous as the pandemic. And they did a survey recently, and it showed that close to a third of people who use social media realize they're, re they're reading fake information. And two out of the five posts on Facebook on COVID-19, people who repost the information, are passing along unreliable information. So there's a huge amount of you know, disinformation out there. Close to 42% of the tweets on COVID are coming from bots. They're not even coming from human beings. And close to 40% of the COVID posts that you see on Google or Facebook need a warning label. So we are, we are talking about an infodemic. I don't think that uh, UNESCO is exaggerating here. There's an enormous amount of disinformation about the pandemic out there. And that's the environment in which we are working as journalists. Very difficult. Next slide. You may have heard of this, but there was a video, 26 minute video called Plandemic. And I think it demonstrates how difficult it is to get disinformation out of the public cons consciousness. This video went up. It was by a scientist who has been discredited. It was full of uh, false health claims. Things like, if you wear a mask, you'll get sick. Or as I said before, one of the things uh, people are talking about is that COVID is a conspiracy. Uh, in this case, you know, that the vaccine makers are, have created a conspiracy so they can make vast profits. Um, so what happened? Well, you know, Facebook and Google, you know, removed it from their sites and Twitter blocked it from Twitter. But the problem is that uh, people are sharing it in their own social networks. So it's almost impossible to get this disease out of the circulatory system of the internet. It's still gonna go out there and it's still living on and living on. So this is, 
very difficult. And these ideas, people are not very good. Sort of, um, researchers have shown that people who read information online are not very good about being critical on what is the source of this information? Is this a credible source or is this a, a not a credible source? People don't know how to tell you know, a credible source from one that is not. So they believe this stuff. And one of the dangers of the type of disinformation we're seeing in this pandemic is that there's just a little nugget of a half truth in there. It kind of sounds like it could be the case. For example, the, um, in Indonesia and also other African countries, sunlight could help cure you of COVID. Well, you know, there is a little truth to that. As I said earlier, uh, sunlight is good for you in a small amount. It does boost your immune system. It may help you if you contract COVID, maybe not to get quite so sick. So you see a little half truth in there. But conspiracy theorists blow it out of proportion to the point where it becomes completely false. Next slide. So how, how did this happen? How did this completely false pandemic video become a, a blockbuster? Well, because, you know, fringe, let's, I wouldn't even call them news outlets, I really shouldn't, conspiracy outlets, and various on online personalities promoted it. That's how it started. And then online groups, you know, promoted it. And then it was got spread on Facebook and YouTube. And that's how it went viral. So it starts, this is, I actually read a book about this. They've actually studied this. Many of uh, the conspiracy theories start by fringe personalities on fringe websites. They get spread into a more legitimate environment like Facebook or Google, for example, or YouTube. Now it's become viral, and now it's almost impossible to stop. It's already been spread too much. People are spreading it in their own networks. It's almost impossible to stop. Next slide. So how do you spot a fake? You know, uh, I, one of the ways you can spot it is to check out the, the website address. What a lot of these people do with these conspiracy theories, these dodgy cures, use a website that's a form of a brand name that we know. For example, cbsnews.com. Sometimes what they do is they buy websites that news organizations used to have, and they buy them, and they reuse them. But if you went to the website, you would realize right away that this was not cbsnews.com one of the US's most respected broadcasters. You would realize it once you went to that website. The other thing you can watch out for is errors in grammar, you know, typographical errors, mistakes of grammar. A lot of the conspiracy theorists come from countries where English is a third or a fourth language. They don't use it well, and they make a lot of mistakes. That's often a sign of a fake. Also, if you get something and you've never seen it before, chances are you need to do a new search right away. And if you don't see anything that's been written about it in a trustworthy publication, I would not publish it until you verify it with your scientific sources. Do not publish until you have talked to the medical researchers and verified that in fact this is true or not. Do not publish anything that's not been verified. I'd be very skeptical. You know, in this world where we're looking with every second counts to find a new treatment or a new vaccine, be very skeptical of these claims that people are making. Skepticism is a very important tool in the journalist toolbox. Next slide. Two other th things to look out for is very exaggerated language hyperbole, uh, and, and also inflammatory language, language that is, makes people afraid, language that makes them hate a particular group. These are two other signs that what you're looking at is, is fake or is disinformation. So if the, you know, for example, uh, I, was, I read a fake news post, you might have heard, um, there was some fake news circulating a couple weeks ago about Bill Gates, who is, as you probably are aware, um, one of the major players 
funding many efforts to try to find a vaccine or treatment for COVID-19. There was a fake news piece that Melinda Gates was filing for a divorce because uh, she didn't like the fact that her husband was working on a vaccine because vaccines will poison children and turn them autistic, which of course, all of that has been completely disproven. And if you read that fake news post, and I read it, you would realize that an important person like Melinda Gates would never talk in public, even if she was getting a divorce, using that kind of loose language about her husband. She has press people who are very carefully verifying every word in every press release for everything that she does publicly. Melinda Gates, say to yourself, would she really talk like that? Well, no, she wouldn't. She wouldn't use that kind of language. And it was clearly a campaign on the part of the global anti-vax movement, which as you may know, is uh, really taken on a new resurgence during this pandemic. So ask yourself, would this world leader talk like this? Use this kind of loose language, uh, uh, inflammatory language? No. If you looked at even past press releases of things that this leader had said or this important figure, you would see that clearly this is not the kind of language this person would use. Next slide. I would say at the very least, if you get this kind of information, do not pass it along. Don't pass it to your colleagues, don't pass it to friends, and don't pass it to family. It's not a joke. This is not a joke. People unfortunately do not do a good job of being skeptical about the source of information. And people are afraid and we're in a climate of uncertainty. So do not pass along unverified information. It's not funny. It's very serious. Next slide. I'm gonna show you a video by public television on the range of disinformation which is washing across the US and washing across the world and what the press is doing about it. It turns out that misinformation it turns out that misinformation and conspiracy theories about COVID-19 are rapidly spreading online, creating what public health officials around the world are now calling an infodemic. John Yang charged the dangerous course of falsehoods during this global health crisis. Eating this can help prevent infection of the coronavirus. Around the world, journalists find themselves debunking wild claims, miracle cures, and prevention methods. You need to microwave your mail to kill the COVID-19 virus. Stories on the origins of the virus. Is the Wuhan coronavirus a biological weapon? Was it built in a lab by scientists and unleashed on the masses? Theories about vaccines and billionaire Bill Gates. Claiming that he actually created the virus to trick people into getting microchipped. One particularly persistent falsehood, 5G mobile networks transmit COVID-19. You know when they turn this on, it's going to kill everyone. And that's A woman in Britain called workers killers for laying 5G fiber optic cables. When they turn that switch on, bye bye mama. Eva! Across the United Kingdom, arsonists have burned cell towers and the claim has been shared online with millions around the world. The 5G story is complete and utter rubbish. It's nonsense. It's the worst kind of fake news. The reality is that the mobile phone networks are absolutely critical. It's a, a non-stop uh, hurricane of misinformation and disinformation to debunk. Doreen Marchioni is managing editor of Snopes.com. It's a fact-checking website, and it's been inundated with tens of thousands of requests for the truth about coronavirus claims. One of the dumbest that I encountered was uh, if you stick your face in a hot blow, uh, hair dryer, hold a hair dryer to your face, you might blow COVID out of your system. Tonic water, if you drink a lot of it, will cure you? No, it, it, it won't. But it's good in gin and tonics. Many experts call this steady stream of false information and conspiracy theories an infodemic. 
Epidemiologists at the World Health Organization are battling not just the virus, but also bogus claims. A lot of the time they say to me, oh my goodness, I can't believe these people are actually believing this. Um, I can't believe I have to spend time debunking this myth. And we have to look at it from a scientific point of view and have to spend time and resources doing that. At the same time, these are valuable resources could be spent giving and tailoring messages to vulnerable populations. Even President Trump has touted false and, in some cases, dangerous treatment ideas. Most recently, internal use of ultraviolet light and disinfectant. I see the disinfectant where it knocks it out in a minute, one minute. And is there a way we can do something like that uh, by injection inside or, or almost a cleaning? Last week, the president walked back some of those comments, saying he was being sarcastic and was taken out of context. Hydroxychloroquine. Try it if you'd like. And since talking about the possible effectiveness of the anti-malaria drug hydroxychloroquine, Mr. Trump's own Food and Drug Administration is cautioned against using the drug for COVID-19 outside a hospital due to potential heart problems. Last month, a man in Arizona died after ingesting an aquarium cleaning chemical he thought was the drug. As humans, we are far more likely to remember something frightening. David Robert Grimes is a cancer researcher and author of The Irrational Ape, which looks at how people can be duped. We are very poor at critical thinking. We are very poor at evaluating sources. And that makes us very vulnerable to the sheer amount of disinformation that is spreading online. Christina Tardagila is the associate director of the International Fact-Checking Network, which is leading an alliance of 89 organizations monitoring coronavirus content in more than 70 countries. Like an epidemiologist who watches a virus spread, you watch these hoaxes spread. Right. And they're spreading fast, John. We're getting misinformation from my uncle, from my cousin, and also from uh, the president or from the prime minister or even from bots. So it is the first time that we're hearing so much uh, this information all around the planet. That's led to deadly consequences in countries like Brazil, where President Jair Bolsonaro has repeatedly urged citizens to ignore public health warnings. He's compared the virus to a mild flu, even though the nation leads Latin America in confirmed cases and deaths by large margins. And the chaos of the pandemic has opened the door to misinformation techniques similar to Russia's interference in the 2016 U.S. election. We're already seeing evidence of that. Fake Facebook pages run by fake accounts and or fake people that are tr attempting to in some way manipulate either potentially voters or consumers or simply trying to monetize and make money off this crisis. U.S. intelligence agencies now believe that false text messages sent last month to many Americans about a nationwide lockdown were pushed by Chinese operatives aiming to sow discord. USA! And there are the recent nationwide protests of stay-at-home orders that President Trump has at times encouraged. The seemingly organic movement was in fact organized and driven by far-right Facebook groups that have become a hotbed for conspiracy theories. Social media giants, including Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, have all faced growing criticism about their role in the spread of misinformation. Facebook, which is a funder of the news hour, now alerts users when they interact with false coronavirus content. On another popular platform, Reddit, users have long policed each other to varying degrees of success. Especially as a scientist, the way that I have to verify things has changed entirely. Emerson Ailey Boggs, a virologist by training, moderates Reddit's coronavirus page, which has more than two million subscribers. There's a lot of bad science that comes out during outbreaks, and there's a lot of good science that gets misinterpreted and editorialized, even when it's reported faithfully in the first place. If I can't prove it, I don't really want to be associated with it, and I don't want to be responsible for now two million people seeing it and taking it as fact. Despite the flood of misinformation during this crisis, scientist David Robert Grimes believes it can be brought under control. We have to remember that social media and the internet, they are new technologies. And we've always had this problem of being 
bad at identifying sources of information. The internet has massively exacerbated it. But I'm also optimistic that we can all collectively learn how much of a problem this is when we don't check our sources. But for now, misinformation is spreading faster than the virus itself and could be with us long after the pandemic is over. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm John Yang. Such an important report. Thank you, John. Okay, next slide. So uh, you, journalists have to be a part of this solution, uh, but it's tricky. Um, and this, like the internet, you know, understanding how to debunk disinformation is also something that we are just learning about. Um, it's not necessarily to debunk every myth that comes around, but what is important is that if there is a myth that takes hold in the public consciousness in Ghana and it starts to change behavior in an unhealthy way, uh, this is the moment when you need to come in and you need to fact check uh, and publish a story or publish uh, uh, some kind of a news short uh, to let people know that they shouldn't be taking such and such medication or whatever the case may be. Next slide. It's not enough. The problem with health authorities is they, they tend to communicate through very traditional channels, not so much through the media. So their messages, even the World Health Organization, don't necessarily always reach the average people. That's where we come in. But there's a couple of tricks to how you actually fact check. When you're fact checking on a, a claim, focus on what's, what works. Focus on the truth rather than giving too much information about the claim itself. Tell the claim briefly, but make sure to put into your article what we know that is working against the coronavirus. And as repetitive as it is, you need to come back and remind people about wearing masks, self-distancing, staying at home when they can. Remind them what works. And don't, don't give attention to any idea that comes across, just those that are seriously causing a problem in the country. Because if you, if, if you report on every crackpot theory, then you're actually giving these conspiracy theories and disinformation, you're, making, you're giving legitimacy to their ideas. So don't do it unless it's actually something quite serious that is taking hold in the public consciousness. Next slide. So for example, as you're probably aware, uh, Madagascar has been talking about an herbal mix. This is a story that Reuters did about it, talking about a possible herbal treatment, let's call it, for COVID. So here's what the Reuters report says. You, again, stick to the science. Self-proclaimed plant-based cure, so that people know it's not a cure, on sale in several African countries have already put in orders to buy this. Despite warnings, you see the WHO Health or you should contact the WHO, they are warning that this treatment is still unproven. You should put that in there, warning your public that there is no proof that this herbal mix does anything. Next slide. So, then get into the herbal compound itself. In this case, let's talk about what it's made up of. Certain compounds are effective in malaria drugs, the WHO says, but the plant itself cannot treat malaria, just parts of the compounds. A quote from the WHO in Africa saying she is concerned. People who drink too much of the product might feel that they are immune to COVID-19 and engage in risky behavior have that health warning in there and a quote from someone who is capable to talk about it. You have, I believe, a WHO office probably in Ghana. You should quote them on Ghana. Stick to the science. What do we know and what don't we know about these things? And I'm sure these people will be touting about cures in Ghana in the months and perhaps the years to come on COVID. Next slide. Again, the African Union said it was trying to get Madagascar's 
technical data, this is still from the Reuters report on the remedy, and a quote from the African Union, this review will be based on global technical and ethical norms to get the necessary scientific evidence. It's got to be based on solid science. Stick to the science in your reporting. Talk to those medical researchers. I know you're not health experts. Do not be afraid to ask a dumb question. I don't understand. Could you put that in layman's terms? Don't be afraid to ask a dumb question. Next slide. So just as a last note on fact checking, uh, myths and cures. I'm giving a historical, the only time you have to fact check is if it hasn't been done before. The good news during this pandemic is that you have all these resources that you can go to first and, and find out if this treatment has been fact checked. I have a feeling that it will already be fact checked through one of the sources. So go to these web pages, go to them frequently. Chances are they may even give you enough evidence to actually go into your report. It's not a bad idea, even if it's been fact checked, if it's something taking hold in the mind of the public to publish yet again what you know about a particular treatment or cure and what it does and does not do. Last slide. So, any questions? All right, thank you so much, Sarah. Um, while you're talking um, uh, with this last segment, we got a comment um, from Shirley. Um, I think the pandemic has behaved differently in different environments. We should, at, we should as journalists, help explore our strengths in our specific environment. Um, and then Patricia had a question about, with the issue of fake text messages, which were circulated per the PBS NewsHour report, how do journalists convince telecommunication companies to release details of such persons? Similar fake messages keep going around. Uh, that, that's, of course, a question of privacy law in Ghana that I think you need to look into. You need to actually find out in your telecommunications code whether or not the telecommunications maker uh, can release that information or not. I suspect they can't. But what you can do is you can warn people of these text messages. Uh, in your reports, you can send, you can put in some of the most common text messages that, that, you, that are out there. You can debunk the claims that are in them. You can still do a job if you don't know who the person is. Actually is not the point. The point is to make the public aware that these are fake, and to give, do the good reporting on exactly what is fake in them and not to pay attention to what's happening because I'm, I don't know if you'll be able to find out actually who these people are. Although I think it's something that the government needs to be concerned about and maybe that's a question you should also be asking the health ministry. What are you doing about this to stop this? I think that's a fair question. As to the specific um, environment, of course that's the case. I'm, but uh, what I am sharing with you is best practices on the kind of reporting that you can do no matter what kind of fake news comes up, no matter what kind of health claim comes up, no matter what kind of specific instance of politicizing the message comes up. It's not so much what I'm talking about, but how you respond to it. this class is about. And the examples that I'm showing you are examples of best practices on how you can react, how you can report and how you can respond. Okay, so as a reminder, everybody, you know, this uh, presentation, the presentation that you saw um, during today's session, as well as the recording of today's session, will be made available to you guys afterwards. And if you guys have any questions um, that were not covered and you have them, please send them to Joyce and or myself, and we'll make sure that Sarah gets them so that she can answer. Um, so I just, while you're speaking, I, I asked a question to the group about any, you know, fake news stories that were circulating around Ghana, um, um, just to give you an idea of what uh, the journalists on the line are seeing. And um, one was uh, in Ghana that swimming at the beach could prevent one from contracting the virus. Um, another one that there was a rumor going around that the president, Akufuado himself, had COVID-19. Of course, that was false. 
um, and no one brought this up, but I think uh, I brought this up to you before. And guys, if you want to talk about this more, um, the president of Pujuato made it a point to say that folks that do circulate fake news will be um, prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. And recently we had a story, um, recently we had a story of a 24 year old that released a social media, a video on social media, um, kind of um, propagating the rumor about the 5G network and how that is being put up to circulate uh, or to spread COVID-19. Um, so Donna, as we all know, is not immune to the infodemic as is the rest of the world. So does anyone else have any um, other questions or comments? Now it's time to put it in the chat box. And while we wait for people to put their last minute comments and questions into the chat box, Sarah, did you have anything else to share? I think maybe I'll just reiterate the point that, um, you know, the infodemic is global. For example, the 5G conspiracy has arrived in Ghana. It started in the UK and ended up in Ghana. However, uh, I wouldn't get caught up on the specifics about the US or the specifics about Madagascar or the specifics about Indonesia. It's not about where these examples come. This course is just showing you these examples on how you can respond, what kinds of reporting techniques you need to, to stick to the science. I might just want to make one last point about sources. There are three kinds of sources in health reporting you need to work on very hard during this pandemic. Number one, epidemiologists. The epidemiologists are working very hard on studying the disease, how it's spreading. They're looking at the numbers, they're looking at the studies, they're looking at the statistics. Those should be experts you talk to regularly. The second group are health statisticians. Data is a very important part of this story. If you can't get health statisticians at the health ministry, go to the WHO, go to the CDC, go to uh, Doctors Without Borders, go to other organizations to talk to statisticians. And the third one, of course, are the doctors and the nurses working in the emergency wards in the critical care for the critical cases uh, to get good stories about the effects of, because we also need to know what's happening in the field. This disease is spreading very differently in every country. Uh, people are having different symptoms in every country. For example, in many African countries, the people who are most affected are people, adults between the age of 22 and 29. That's behaving very differently than in France, for example. Uh, so you need also that field uh, the information coming from doctors and, and nurses who are actually working on the scene. So those are the three most important sources who you should be cultivating during this pandemic. All right. Um, so I think we can wrap up. We just got some more comments about, I think uh, the concern for a lot of journalists here is that the public, general public, uh, they don't truly believe that COVID-19 is actually a thing that they should be concerned about. So that's an uphill battle for them. Um, and uh, just the reporting on these quote unquote cures to try to get the information to, to the public as well. Um, so with that, thank you so much, Sarah. I think um, as is a tradition that we have started uh, from, the last, uh, from the last session, I wanna do a group photo so, um, so for those who would like to be in the photo, you can turn off your video so we can see your lovely faces. So we have a memento of the second session. And I'm gonna do something a little bit different. I'm gonna unmute everybody so that you guys can express how much you have enjoyed this session as well. Um, but before I do that, I just want to say thank you to ARS Paris, and I want to say thank you to Sarah for imparting such awesome knowledge, and um, thank you to my team here at the U.S. Embassy for helping out with the moderation, courage, slideshow, Joyce alerting me of myriad of technical difficulties, and thank you for your patience as my power went out at least a couple of times. <laughs> and um, so I think everyone is off. I'm going to unmute everybody. So you guys can say thank you. I'm going to take a picture. One, 
Right. Thank you guys so much. That was a varying success. It's probably very hard for everyone to say thank you at the same time with like 35 people on the line. It was an experiment. But um, so thank you guys so much. As a reminder, um, we recorded this session and we will definitely send the recording to you guys and the presentation. So hopefully I'll see all of your smiling faces. Next Wednesday is our last session of this three-part series on reporting on COVID-19. Um, this session, uh, that session, um, Sarah will be talking about going beyond the tally, um, talking more about in-depth reporting about COVID-19. Um, so with that, uh, we will say adieu and goodbye.